There's a new kid on the block. It is the Agora Flow battery. Now what they're claiming is 90 watt hours per kilo as energy density, which is pretty good. And what they're also saying is they're able to suck CO2 out of the air and change it using their battery as part of charging their battery, which is pretty cool stuff. So what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about batteries, how flow batteries differ, the kind of flow battery that led to the Agora, and the kind of flow battery you could make yourself if you wanted to, and how Agora fits into that. Now batteries store electrical energy as a chemical reaction, and that's because all chemical reactions are in fact about sharing electrons. If you put two chemicals together and they react, what they're doing is exchanging electrons. What you need to do is make sure that those electrons can't be shared immediately. You need to force them to go out of the battery from one side and in at the other side, so that reaction will force the electrons around an outside wire. When you can do that, we can use that outside wire to do work, you know, light a light, turn a motor, that kind of thing. So the essence of them is that there must be something that can react. You must make sure that the electrons travel outside of the battery. If they don't, if they travel inside the battery, it's a short. And of course, they'll do that because the distance isn't great. And so your battery will be no use. When you have the battery, there are two components, the anode and the cathode. One material is usually put on the anode, the other material is usually put on the cathode. And this is exactly what happens when you think of something like your car battery. The ions are able to move because they have an electrolyte. The electrolyte allows ion movement, but it prevents electron movement. And so there's always a separator between them to stop them touching. And so the electrons must go outside of the battery, and that's the essence of what a battery actually is. So you need two materials that can react. You need a separator to hold them apart and stop them shorting. And you need an electrolyte that allows the movements of ions but prevents the movement of electrons. Get those, you've got a battery. Now in a traditional way, again like in your car battery, those materials that are going to react are actually on the battery blades. And the battery is only as good as how big it is, how much mass of that reacting material you can cram into the case. But it's not the only way to do it. You can actually have the electrolyte carry the reactive materials. And of course, when you do that, what you're starting to do is think about something called a flow battery. But flow batteries are essentially, basically, where the reacting materials are in the electrolyte. Now we've made types of batteries like this, and the famous one is the zinc bromide battery. We're going to make a zinc bromine battery from a plant pot and a glass. Now the plant pot's important. It is unglazed terracotta, which means it's porous. So it's going to act as a separator and ion filter, and it's got no hole in the bottom. Now if yours is a hole in the bottom, well, fill the hole. Just pour some resin in there and it'll fill the hole and the rest of the plant pot will do the job. We're lucky, ours doesn't have a hole and it fits rather nicely into there. So there's our battery container all made. So here we have a container that's going to separate the anode and the cathode with a porous membrane. And that's what you're looking for. Now, gravity will form a part in this because the... One electrode is going to go at the bottom, and the other electrode is going to go at the top. And of course, it's standing upright, it's a liquid, so the bromine is going to sink to the bottom, which is great because it'll help perform that function. <laughs> We've made our battery. <laughs> and that's hilarious, isn't it? Just stick a plant pot in a glass and you've made your battery. Once you've done that, of course, we need the two electrodes. That is a lump of graphite. And it comes out of the ground like a rock, just like that. And it can be a little size like this, or it can be as big as a car. Graphite comes from the ground, dug out as a rock, and it looks like a rock. And if you want to make it into plates, actually, you saw it up pretty much like you saw up uh, marble for a kitchen tabletop or for a fireplace. These were sent to me by a very good friend of mine. He sent me some graphite plates, and there you go. That is just a bit of rock sewn up into a nice, pretty square plate, and you can buy them. You can buy them at any size, actually. I don't actually know how much they cost, because, like I say, I didn't buy these. Now that is be going to become one of our electrodes. Okay, so that's my seal dried. And like I say, we've just got to seal it with something. And then that pops in there like that. Bend the wire over. 
our plant pot goes in the top like that and then we need a bit of zinc. Now any old zinc will do and you can find zinc all over the place. They use it at the bottom of boats for instance as a sacrificial anode. I've got a bit of zinc foil that I bent over and that will go in there. So now all we have to do is fill that with its electrolyte. This electrolyte is zinc bromide. Now zinc bromide is a commercial chemical. So if you want to buy a pallet load of this stuff, piece of cake. Just order it and you won't pay that much for it. But buying a couple of kilos actually can be a little bit challenging, but you can make it really easily from something like sodium bromide and zinc sulfate. You chuck them all into the water and you evaporate it off. When you evaporate it off, that salt you get will be sodium sulfate. And the greenish liquid is the zinc bromide. So evaporate it a bit, pour off the zinc bromide and you'll have some zinc bromide. And that's a great way of making a couple of kilos. But if you're going to do 10 kilos or so, you're better off just buying yourself a 25 kilo sack. And you find that really easy to get. Uh, China and India sell it. Anyway, that's our zinc bromide solution. It's a concentrated solution. And we just pour it in here. Ta -da! That's our battery done. Don't Charge this bad boy, hook it up to a power supply and stick it on 1.8 volts. Now I quite frequently use something called constant voltage. So I'll stick it on 1.8 volts and just put up with whatever amps flow through it until the uh, battery cell equals 1.8 volts, then it's charged. But zinc bromide is actually a plating stripping battery, so it charges best by something called constant current. Now the current you need to apply is somewhere between 30 and 50 milliamps per square centimetre of the graphite electrode there. So whatever your area is, and this is, um, I think this one is 5 by 6, so it's 30 square centimetres, what you do is bang the voltage up until you get the respective current flowing through, and then it's going to charge much more quickly. Safest way, constant voltage, correct way, constant current. Anyway, I've banged that on at 1.8 volts, so take a while, let's just leave it to charge. So after a little bit of charging, you'll see the bromine forming right there beneath the actual carbon plate. You won't see the zinc because it's been put onto the zinc plate, but the bromine's really obvious. Now, constant current means maintaining the current at a constant value. So you'll see the current go up, and what you have to do is drop the voltage to keep the constant current, hence the term. The energy density is directly related to the amount of zinc bromine you've got in there. Now, as it's uh, plating, then obviously it's taking ions out of the solution and sometimes a support salt can help so you add another salt in there and that'll be the ion carrier or you just don't charge it fully and allow that to happen. It will last as long as that colour is there. It'll discharge at 1.8 volts for absolutely ages. Now I've got a little motor here and we're just going to hook up the motor and give that a spin as a demonstration that there's some power in there. Make sure it's not going to hit. Oops. <laughs> okay, that's going bananas, obviously. It's really spinning at a rate of knots, and it will continue to do that. So you get a 1.8 volts and a high ampage discharge out of that. Now, the fact that the energy is stored in the liquid and not on the plates is very important because we made a single glass full, and one that's used up is used up, but we don't have to do that. We could keep that liquid in an external storage tank and pump it through a cell stack. The cell stack will perform the function that we did with the plant pot and we would have as much energy stored as we can pump through that cell stack. That is, the cell stack is independent from the liquid and as much liquid as we can pump through the stack can be stored in separate containers, and that is the essence of a flow battery. And of course, this is being done by a company called Redflow, an Australian company, who store the bromine as a complex in the liquid. They had a, another chemical that complexes the bromine and prevents it escaping, making it very safe. Of course, storing it in separate tanks means that it never self-discharges. So storage life is a very long time. You only get self-discharge with the zinc bromine battery if you keep them in the same cell. You pump them into different containers, they'll basically last forever. 
So the red flow, zinc bromide battery, isn't strictly a flow battery, because in a flow battery what you really want are two liquids that you can push through the cell, almost if it's, as if it's a fuel cell. But of course, with zinc bromide, what you're doing is you're plating out the zinc, and of course the cell stack can only take so much zinc until it's blocked, and so there's still a dependency on the cell stack size for the amount of energy a battery can actually contain. In an ideal flow battery, that shouldn't be the case. Now, this is where Agora step in. Now, it's known that CO2 will dissolve in water. If you make the water a very high pH by adding an alkali, then lots and lots of it will dissolve. And if you put a catalyst in there, it'll turn into a formate, which is just a salt. So what Agora have done is they chuck a load of sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide in there and form a potassium formite. In the presence of bromine, when they discharge that, what you get is potassium bromide, which is nice and soluble. You get potassium carbonate, which you can actually recover and sell, or sodium carbonate, and water. On the charging up side, of course, what you're doing is you're pulling in carbon dioxide, dissolving it to make the formate with the catalyst, and so they're able to sequester carbon dioxide that would otherwise be chucked out into the air. And of course, what they've created is a true flow battery. So what Agora is saying is that they're able to produce a true flow battery with energy density somewhere in the region of 90 watt hours a kilo, which is pretty interesting stuff. Of course, they're also saying that they're able to sequester an awful lot of carbon dioxide from industry that would otherwise just get chucked into the air. Now, they are using expensive catalysts. They're using palladium and lanthanum for that dissolving the CO2 and changing it into the formate, which is an integral part of their battery. Red flow, of course, doesn't do that. But this idea of using bromine bromide as part of a flow battery is certainly giving good results and certainly well worth keeping your eye on because flow batteries, remember, are about the energy in the liquid as opposed to the energy that's actually bunged into the cell. And they're very interesting things. They tend to be more efficient the bigger they are. So anything sort of 5, 10, 15 kilowatt hours isn't that great because you need an awful lot of pumps and ancillary stuff to make it work. Anything above 50 or so, 50 kilowatt hours, then it starts to become more cost effective to think in terms of a flow battery than just a whole load of batteries. Anyway, Agora's reached the headlines. It is interesting stuff. I thought I would do a video on a bit of the background, how it actually works, where it sits in things like bromide batteries. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.